He's heard it all before. You're a pastor. You're not supposed to get political. You shouldn't be talking about these issues, so just stay out of politics and stick to preaching the gospel. Life, marriage, sexuality, borders, ethnicity, these things aren't political. They're biblical. God's Word has much to say about the culture we're living in. This is Our Watch with Tim Thompson. Well, hey, everybody, happy Sunday to you. I am Tim Thompson, Senior Pastor of 412 Church in Temecula Valley, and I'm very glad to be with you on Sunday. I always love bringing God's Word to your life, and I pray that it's a blessing to you. It certainly is a blessing to me. With me, as always, is Jake Porter. Jake is the Assistant Pastor of 412 Church in Temecula Valley. Jake, always good to be with you. Yeah, it's always great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I love having you here. We love talking about God's Word. Today, we get to talk about something that, that you and I definitely have a passion for, and that is waiting on the Lord. Yeah. We say waiting on the Lord, waiting for His return, waiting for Jesus to come back, um, praying, as, as especially for my Catholic friends, that, that prayer, um, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray that prayer, we're saying, Father, we want Your Son to come back. We want Him to establish His kingdom here on earth. We want Your will to take place here on earth. And certainly... Uh, we're not living in a world where that's happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, a world that's not paying attention. Right. I and mean, we talked about that last week, how we've got to be aware, we've got to pay attention to what's going on around us. We can't right. be caught unaware. Right. Uh, we're going to talk more about that that idea of waiting, excuse me, waiting on Jesus. Uh, both of us, uh, by the way, we're in our red letter dilemma for for people who don't. Well, tell people what that is, for people who don't yeah, know what it is. Yeah, so in in uh, primarily the Gospels and in parts of the New Testament, you know, you've got these red letters. These are the words that uh, Jesus spoke during his earthly ministry when he walked this earth. And uh, there are some people that say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to read the red letters and that's it. I, I just want to hear the words of Jesus. I just want to hear from him and, and I'm not going to look anywhere else. And that leaves you with several dilemmas. And, and one of those dilemmas is the fact that the entire Bible from the very first word in Genesis all the way to the last word in Revelation, the entire thing is the word of God. It's all the inspired word of God. It's not just those red letters. It goes far beyond that. Uh, but aside from that, when Jesus would speak in those red letters, he would often refer to the Old Testament. He would often refer to other parts of Scripture. And if you don't go and look at those parts and get the entire context of what he's saying in the midst of those red letters, then you really miss the point of what is being said in the midst of those red letters. So it's important that you get the entire context um, as you always say, text without context is just pretext, and, and you don't really have a, an understanding of what he's saying in the midst of those red letters. So right. we're looking at them, but we're getting the context of them. Right. Yeah. Um, well well put. I think we all need to, to get that context, which is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 12, for those who want to follow along with us. You and I both preached a message on this. We're going to listen to a small portion of that, and then we'll, we'll come back and talk more about this idea of waiting on the Lord. Take a listen to this. Today, as we finish chapter 12 of Luke's gospel, we're going to see that Jesus is continuing this topic. He's, he's going to give us more things to discuss as far as what you and I should be doing as we wait for him to come back. You remember, if you were with us, that Jesus had gone on what I was calling a, an equal opportunity offending tour. You know, he offended the scribes. He offended the Pharisees. He offended the attorneys. He offended the rich people. I mean, he, he was offending everybody. And how was he offending people? Just telling them the truth. You know, and that's the fact is the truth can be very offensive, but the truth needs to be told. It needs to be spoken in love. Uh, Jesus did that, but, you know, people still find offense when you bring truth into their life. Jesus was telling the truth, and then he talked about this man who was a successful farmer whose focus was accumulating for himself. His barns weren't big enough. He was going to tear down, build bigger barns, and it was all about more for himself. And so he was rich towards himself and not rich towards God. His focus was on the here and the now, not on the eternity. And what Jesus was setting the stage for was the idea that there is something you and I should be concerning ourselves with, and that is being concerned with the return of Jesus. Yeah, if we're, if we're concerned, and we, you and I spoke about this last week, if we're concerned about the return of Jesus, we're going to live in the dichotomy that he left us in where we live simultaneously two ways. We live as though he's coming back right now, and we live, live as though he's never coming back in our life. And if we do that, it, like he's never coming back, that means we raise up kids, grandkids, plan for retirement, pay off our home, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if we, uh, we live as though he's coming back right now, we have a sense of 
urgency for personal holiness. We want to be found holy. Uh, we want to be found engaged and being, you know, being of service to the Lord. And we also have a, a sense of urgency for sharing our faith because he's coming back right now. Better hurry up, you know, so that you live simultaneously those both ways. Um, and and we, we apply these things we're going to talk about today. We apply these things to our life with this expectation of his return. So when we get into Luke 12 here, we're going to be picking up in verse 49, and here Jesus says, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. So this this purifying fire, he says, I came to send fire on the earth. He's like, I wish I've already started that fire. And we know that, that there's going to be there is for us even today as a believer, but for them, there was going to be this, this coming of the Holy Spirit that would bring fire to people. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So this is the the work of Jesus. He says, when, when I go to be with the Father, I'm not leaving you orphans. I'm going to send a helper. The Father's going to send the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit will descend. We saw this in Acts chapter 1, you know, the Spirit, the Spirit descending upon the people as tongues of fire on them, and, and that's what God does. Yeah, yeah, and and you know we we see, uh, you know this is we see this in John's gospel of how how John he this is what I was talking about baptized with water and and how Jesus is going to bring something different that something's going to be sent that's different than what the work with that John was doing right you know he was baptizing with water he wasn't doing the the work of Jesus and he was he was saying that in the midst of that 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 the end of the first chapter uh, of his gospel account and. Uh, but it's gonna it's gonna be different when when or it was different when uh, the with the work of Jesus with the work of Christ it was it was different in that sense and um, he talks about cleaning up this this threshing floor he's gonna you know throw all the 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 grain and everything up into the air the wind's gonna take away the the stuff that doesn't belong he's gonna gather the wheat up and then the chaff is gonna be burned the stuff that's not of value the the stuff left over from even the tares it's all gonna be gathered up and burned right uh, there, there's there's some consequence that comes with that. Right. You know, and, and I just want to read, um, we see in Acts chapter 2 when that day of Pentecost had come. So in Acts chapter 1, the, the people of God assemble together, they go into this upper room. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost, and now this is 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, the day of Pentecost, and that's what Penta means, we're talking about 50 here. So 50 days later, um, this day had fully come. They were all in one accord, with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What a cool experience. Yeah, yeah. Go in a group of people and... Here, come out the church, right? You know that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, this loose knit group of people, and all of a sudden they are united by the Spirit of God. Yeah, which we get to experience today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, th- yeah. Go ahead. I, I just think it's cool to think that when you know when we receive Jesus and and turn our life towards Him and receive the Spirit, it's the same Spirit of God that we're talking about here. Right. That that came upon them. Right. And we might not experience in it experience that in that sense, but it's the it's the same spirit that that resides in us. And I think that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah, well when Jesus was baptized, he went he was immersed in the water. Uh, he comes out and then the heavens open and you hear this voice of God, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Spirit of God had descended upon Jesus and filled Jesus. And so he's got the the Holy Spirit in him and we watch what Jesus did, all the miracles. Um walking with the Spirit of God in him, miracle after miracle after miracle. And I can't help but to think of the words of Christ when he said, these things I have done, you will do also, and many more you will do. And we have to find ourselves filled with the Spirit of God and living a pure and a holy life and being on fire for Jesus. I, I want to see those kind of things happen. You know, Jesus walked through walls. Jesus walked through group. People tried to grab him. They couldn't grab him. 
It was as if his body was was a ghost, and they tried to grab him. And he walks right through them. He he just did amazing, amazing things. He gave sight to the blind. He resurrected the dead to life. He walked on water, changed water to wine. I mean, what an incredible life he lived. And he says, yeah, the stuff I did, you're going to do that too. You're going to do greater things than that. Do we believe that in life? Like, do we actually believe that and walk like that through life? Or are we, we walk around not filled with his spirit? We, we have to be honest and ask ourselves these questions. Right, right. Not that that leads to a boasting or an, right. an arrogance no. or anything in yeah. it. But, but we've got to live our lives as if we believe in that power. Yeah. Not as if we do it, that, that we do, you know? Right. Um, yeah, it's something we got to believe in. Yeah, you know, in his resurrected state, Jesus was on this road to, to Emmaus. And, and I bring this up because there's this purifying fire that, that's in our life. The Holy Spirit is in us. And we want to be found pure as we're waiting, waiting on the Lord. We want to be found pure, equipped, engaged. And you talk about the purifying fire. There's the Holy Spirit and there's the Word of God. And both work in conjunction with one another, and both of them are a purifying source for us, this purifying fire. As Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, as Jesus was walking along this road in Luke chapter 24, he he meets these two people on the road to Emmaus. He's talking with them, and he's like, what's going on? And they're like, what do you mean, what's going on? Haven't you heard about Jesus of Nazareth? He was crucified, and they can't find his body. He's like, are you the la- are you the last one to hear about this? And Jesus is like, no, tell me more. And they don't realize it's Jesus. So he just starts talk this dialogue with them and as he does this he starts to share his word with them and then all of a sudden he reveals to them who he is and then he vanishes and these guys in Luke chapter 24 verse 32 these guys said did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us our hearts burned within us and that's that purifying fire as you open God's word, when you open God's word and you dig in like this, it should be this burning fire in you, purifying you. Equip it, as Ephesians 4.12 says, one of our 4.12 verses at 4.12, that it's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. When you open it up, that burning fire is, is fanned in who you are, and you want to engage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think about how gold is refined. You, know, yeah. you take fire and you melt it down and then all the impurities come to the top and you scrape it off and you let it harden and then you bring fire to it again and you know it gets rid of these impurities and it, and it brings this purifying process right you know and that's that's what needs to happen inside of us right right um, we want to talk more about this waiting on the Lord we got to take a quick break and listen to a word from our sponsor we'll be right back after this Exciting news, Riverside County. 412 Church, Temecula Valley has moved into our brand new church home, and we're inviting you to join us. Located conveniently right off Jefferson between Rancho, California, and Overland, our new location is ready to welcome you with open arms. Join us for one of our four service times at 7 a.m., 8.45, 10.30, or 12.15. Our engaging children's ministry and youth ministry are available during the second, third, and fourth services. Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Tim Thompson, and here at 412 Church in Temecula Valley, we teach the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Love to invite you to come out and join us for worship and praise, and let's dive into the Word of God together. For more information, check out 412temecula.com. We can't wait to see you there. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to Our Watch. I'm Tim Thompson. With me, as always, is Jake Porter. We are both pastors over at 412 Church in Temecula Valley, and we are talking about waiting on the Lord. Yeah, yeah, we, we kind of started off talking about how we've got to be purified, allow the allow the the fire that comes from God to purify us right. uh, and refine us, and and you talked about this fire being stoked in us that we continue to fan into flame and um and, and just allow that to to go to work inside of us. Right, right, and and we as we move on. And by the way, anybody who just joining us, we're in Luke chapter twelve. If they want to follow along, we're in verse fifty one here, and. What this teaches us here is that we have to prepare for both division and unity. So let's let's explain that. Verse 51 says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? Now, this is Jesus asking a very important question. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? And, and I think if you ask the average Christian or person who I say flies the banner of Christianity, they might not be a Christian, but they say they are. The, the average Christian in America 
did Jesus come to bring peace? Is is that what he came for? And they, I think they say yes. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, and if we follow his his example, we'll have this peace. And, and I think they think he came to bring peace. So all they have to do is go to the scriptures and, and find out what Jesus himself says. So he says, do you suppose I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all. Man, that just, it doesn't work well for the modern woke Christian, you know, Christianity that we see in many churches across America, this idea that Jesus is just, you know, so, so nice. And, and I'm sick and tired of hearing that, that Jesus was nice. Jesus was not nice. He told the truth in love. And sometimes, it, you know, the idea of nice, we've talked about this a lot, it means to ignore. Right. That's the etymology of the word nice. It means to ignore. And we, we do our, our children a big disservice when we try to, tr- we try to raise up nice kids. And, try, and, and a pastor does the community a disservice when he tries to raise up nice Christians. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. Jesus wasn't nice. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus wasn't nice. You know, he, he met that woman at the well. He, he said, hey, woman, go get me your, your husband. She says, I don't have one. He goes, I know you don't. You've had five. Man, you're living with right now is not your husband. Now, that's not very nice, but that's the truth. And it was given to her in love, and we know that her life was forever changed because she was told the truth in love. And that's that's something we have to be willing to do is is give that that truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It may hurt to hear this, but you got to hear it. And that doesn't always bode well with our culture today. A culture that that says you if you love me, you have to accept everything and and celebrate with me in my sin. That's not. That's not the Lord at all. So he says, you think I came to bring peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, personally, I'm glad for that because the church should look very different than the culture. There should be a dividing line between the church and the culture. And the moment that the church begins to look like the culture, that division has been eliminated. Right. And it's what you're talking about. It's it's this this idea of being nice and in the name of love, we we've bridged this gap that uh, you you can you can show up just as you are, which is fine. Everybody's more than welcome to show up to the church just as you are. But the idea is you allow God to start doing a work inside of you that where you become transformed and and your life is sanctified and set apart, and, and you no longer you no longer are the same person or or live the same way or you don't have the same life that you had when you walked in the first time. There's a change that should happen, right. and it creates this division. My life was like this, but now because of Jesus, now this is how my life is like. There's a there's a transformation there, not right. not the idea of oh, it's just you know in the name of love. There's just this you know you can be part of the culture and be part of the church, and it's just let's blend it together. No, there's a there's a division between the two, right? And this is a hard pill for some to swallow, but here it says in verse 52, from now on five and one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother-in-law, or mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What does this tell us? That when you come into contact with Jesus, you have to make a decision. You cannot ride the fence when it, when it comes to the Lord. When you meet Jesus, you're either for him or you're against him. And if you are undecided, you're against him because you can't be undecided. You are for him or against him. So there's going to be a division even within the family, even with a father and a son or a mother and a daughter. There's going to be a division. And in fact, you know, we're supposed to understand that that we have to love God more than we love our father or more than we love our son, more than we love our mother or our daughters. We have to love God first. And if we love God first, we're going to stand for what is true and right before God even if our family doesn't like it. And we know this, uh, we, you and I know this very well. There's, there's going to be some family members that, that don't fall in line with what God wants, and then the family has to make a decision, you know, what am I going to do? And that's hard. That's, I, I'll give it to people. That is very difficult, you know, um, but it's, it's a very real thing that we find here. So we have to be prepared for the division and the unity. But I would say this, there's going to be division, no doubt, but there's going to be a great unity that comes with it as well. Yep. Uh, and that's that's the beauty in it is, yeah, it will divide, but then you'll have this unity. So, you know, we get together as brothers in Christ. Like there's this unity of spirit and this idea that, that we love God and we can serve God together. And, and I don't care where you go in the world, the second you come in contact with somebody who has the spirit of God in them, you feel that unity right away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, there's, there's nothing like coming together. 
as as the church does or as the church should. And yeah. the culture wants to stop that. You know, the culture doesn't want that to take place. Satan doesn't want that to take place because he right. knows the power that comes with that. Right. Um, and, and but I, you know, something that I always circle back to every time I, I think about these things is that there's a blessing that comes from obedience. You do what God's called you to do, and it's it, it's never right. going to turn void. It, it's there's always going to be a blessing that comes from it. It's a blessing to gather together as a church family and fellowship with one another, and open up the Word together, and break bread together, and do all these things together as as the church should, and it brings a great amount of unity. Right. And it is something we should celebrate. Uh, you know, we should recognize it, recognize the unity, and celebrate that unity. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the reasons I had, um, you know, we, we have this whole TemeculaUnity.com thing. And it, for, for some of our audience might not know this, but there's a, a this radical, nasty group in Temecula. They call themselves Temecula Unity, and they don't want unity. <laughs> You know, they don't want, excuse me, they don't want unity for our culture. They don't want unity for our community. All they do is seek to divide everybody, and they bring in radical ideas and try to push them on everybody. When when we as Christians, we're not trying to force our way of life on anyone. The door is open. If people want to join that way of life, it's open, but we don't force it. And they're trying to force their way on us. And so they call themselves Temecula Unity, and and I said, you know, I don't like that they call themselves Temecula Unity because they're not really truly seeking unity. We are. Uh, and true unity is found in Christ, right? Yeah. So um, I said, let me let me ask you, what what is this group? Because when I first heard about them, I didn't even know who they were. I said, tell me about this group. Well, they have a little Facebook page. I go, well, they have a website? Uh, I don't know. We, we looked it up. We're like, oh, no, they, they don't have Temecula.com. So I said, hey, buy it. Buy the URL. Buy .com. Dot, dot net dot org buy them all and let's redirect that for 12 churches website it's exactly what we did and we started these temecula unity events where it is the spirit of god that's going to unify us and we're going to bring the church together and like i said recognize the the unity and celebrate it yeah yeah absolutely and, you know these are community things where it's the whole community together right. is the goal you know right. it's not just you know oh it's this group of people and you got to become this group of people no it's a it's a truly a, a, an event that, that unites people. Right. And, and you know, <laughs> uniting people in worship, uniting people in prayer, uniting people in, in doing things where God's the center of it. Right. Yeah, if you truly love Jesus, you're you're a part. Right. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you are a part. Um, last week we talked about this, and we only have a couple of minutes left, so I, but I want to make sure we touch on it, is while we're waiting on the Lord, we have to be able to discern the times and days Excuse me. Discern the times and days that we're, we're living in. Verse 54, would you read that for us? Yeah, he says, Then he also said to the multitudes, this is Jesus speaking, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather. And there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Yeah. Incredible. You know, and, and, and I'll just briefly, just so people understand, 400 years, more, ju just over 400 years prior to this taking place, a prophecy was given. A prophecy was given that, that Jesus would be there in, in Jerusalem. And all they had to do was say, okay, uh, from the going forth, this is found in Daniel chapter 9, from the going forth of the command to rebuild the temple, uh, there's going to be this amount of time. So, okay, so when was that command given? Okay, let's start counting down. They could count down to the day, knowing when Jesus was going to show up. And and what do we have now? We have a very similar thing. Matthew twenty four. We talked about last week. A whole list of things that all we have to do is say, okay, what's ha what does he say? Is it happening? Yes, it's happening. All we got to do is pay attention. We're not going to be caught unaware. So many people of the time of Jesus were caught unaware. Not everyone, but many people were caught unaware because they just weren't paying attention. We have to be paying attention. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If we can determine the weather and pay attention to what's going on in the skies, we can pay attention to what's going on in the world and compare it to what the Word of God has to say. Right, absolutely. Pastor Jake, that's all the time we got left. Thank you for joining me. Yep, thanks for having me. It's always yeah. a blessing to be here. Always a blessing to have you. Always a blessing to have you guys tuned in. If you have questions about the second coming of Christ, that are we looking forward to the rapture of the church, uh, the resurrection of the dead, we'd love to talk to you about that more. Reach out to us, info at rwatch.com. Love to talk to you more about that. We'll see you next week right here on Our Watch with Tim Thompson. This has been a production of Our Watch with Tim Thompson. We hope you're encouraged to engage the culture around you.
We want to invite you to connect with Pastor Tim by going to the Connect page on ourwatch.com. That's O-U-R watch.com. Until next time, this is all of us at Our Watch reminding you to be bold, be strong, and to take back the public square.